People ask, what is the gospel? People answer, well, it's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. People, uh, others say, well, it's the good news. Well, what's the good news? Well, some have four points, four spiritual laws, and we're the Roman road. Some have five points. Doug Coe, the founder of and leader of the uh, fellowship the last 60 years, um, which is in charge of uh, like the National Prayer Breakfast, which was last Thursday in Washington, D.C., uh, he's tra he traveled to all 196 countries in the world and taught Christian leaders around the world. And he says, I did a survey, and out of 3,000 leaders around the world, only six told me the answer, I believe, of what the gospel is. He says, I'm confused. What is the gospel? Are there four points or are there five points? What do I have to believe to get into heaven? And he asked them, what was Saul of Tarsus called by Christ to do? And most people say, well, he was called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Okay, and so Co says, well, where does Jesus say that? And most of them answer, well, Jesus didn't say that, but Paul said that about himself. Well, Coe says, well, actually, Jesus did say that. They say, where? He says, I'm not going to tell you where. You're the leaders. You're the teachers. You know the Bible. But he says, you're right. Jesus did say that. But he said they're, they're to, Paul was to take the gospel to the Gentiles, but he told them to take it to two other groups. And they say, Who? I'm not going to tell you. You tell me. You're the leaders. And most of them guess, well, he also told them to take the gospel to the Jews. That's right. What's the third group? So they start to guess. Well, take the gospel to the sick. Take it to the poor. He says, out of 3,000 leaders, only 18 could tell me who he tell, said to take the gospel to. But he says he didn't just tell them to take the gospel, didn't tell them to take the gospel, he told them to take something else. In Acts chapter 19, or no, chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus is going to Damascus to put Christians in jail. He's so upset about the new way, it's called. He thinks it's a sect from the Jewish faith, so he's trying to put them in prison. And on the way, Jesus meets him, the flashing light from heaven, and he's blinded. And Jesus asks, why, Saul, are you persecuting me? And that's when Saul learned that Jesus was not just a, uh, the starter of a sect, but he really was the Son of God. And so uh, Saul is blinded, and he's in a house, and Jesus asks Ananias, a Christian follower, to take his message to him. And so he says to Ananias, Go, this man, Saul, is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. He called Paul to take his name. One person, you would know if I told you, said, Oh my goodness, I have preached around the world, and this is the first time I've heard that the gospel is not some points that I have to believe in order to get into heaven. It's a person. It's amazing that people don't know this. Your faith begins with Jesus, and it ends with Jesus. Peter preached. Peter and John had healed a man 
All these people gathered around him, Jews in Jerusalem, then know this, Peter says, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which... We must be saved. The gospel is not information about Jesus. It's not points you have to believe in order to go to heaven. You can know all kinds of points about Jesus. The devil knows all kinds of things about Jesus. The gospel is Jesus. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's not Christianity. It's not religion. Lauren Daigle has written a song, Losing My Religion. I'm losing my religion to find you. I'm losing my religion in finding something new. Because I need something different, and different looks like you. I'm losing my religion to find you. To find you. You. Just a look, look at a little bit of her in concert. Danny, you're going to one of them. Right? <laughs> I'm losing my religion because I'm trying to find you. Jesus is the gospel. The gospel is not religion. It's a relationship with Jesus. What is the gospel? The gospel is a person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, is the gospel, not just some content about him. Too often the gospel is mixed with subtle add additions like devotional habits, how you read the Bible, like behavioral practices, what you do. Paul writes, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray by your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The gospel is devotion to Christ, nothing else. We're very adept at adding things to Christ. Commandments, beliefs, practices, customs, rituals. The emphasis of the gospel is simply Jesus. Jesus did not come to start a religion. He came to call every human being on this planet into a relationship with him. So remember this, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. A gospel that adds anything to Jesus is not good news. The gospel is a person and his name is Jesus. Say that with me. The gospel is a person and his name is... And Jesus is the way. In Jesus' farewell discourse, which is 
John 13 to 17. It's his final teaching on the last night before he was crucified. In John 14, he says, I'm going away. You know where I'm going. And Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? And Jesus doesn't give him a place, but he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says he is the way. Not a way. This is important. If we say a way, it presupposes that there are other ways. That's a very popular belief in our culture today, that there are a lot of ways. One belief is, is probably as good as another. They'll all get you to God. All roads lead to the top of the mountain. People think belief in Jesus as the way is too limiting. What's popular today is to think that all beliefs in varying degrees are pretty much the same. By declaring that he is the way, Jesus is emphatically saying that the gospel is him. There is no other way. He alone is the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's not making a statement of arrogance, but one of qualification. Jesus is the way, the only way, because he's the only one who is sinless. Peter says he committed no sin. <coughs> no deceit was found in his mouth. Jesus is the only way because he's the only one who can reveal to us the Father. John says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Jesus is the only way to God, because he's the only one who could pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man, it's a reference to himself that he's the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Because Jesus offered salvation as a free gift through his death on the cross for everyone's sins, people from every part of the world have access to God. A relationship with God is not determined by our skin color or our socioeconomic status or our education, our pedigree or our merit or our religion but rather received as a gift of grace available to everyone who comes in repentance to Jesus. Jesus is the only way to God, but his arms of invitation extend around the world. Jesus invites everyone to come to him, whether they're atheists or agnostics or Buddhists or Muslims or Jews or of Christian background or no religious background whatsoever. Jesus says, and when I'm lifted up, talking about when he's lifted up on the cross, from the earth will draw all people to myself. We can't impart salvation to anyone, but we can point people to Jesus who draws people to himself. The gospel is a person and his name is Jesus. And Jesus is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. He claims to be the source of unconditional, objective truth. Jesus is making a profound claim, it, claim that all truth is truth in him. All the Mosaic law, as well as scientific laws, find their credibility as truth in so much as they are subordinate to Jesus, the truth. In John 5, Jesus heals a crippled man. And he does it on the Sabbath. And the, the Jewish religious leaders are all upset that Jesus continues to heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, he, he responds by telling them who he is and what his authority is. 
so they can understand that he can heal on any day of the week. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me for life. The scriptures he refers to are what we call the Old Testament. The Jews call it the Tanakh. So this is the Hebrew scriptures. The first five books of the Bible, Hebrew reads backwards, by the way, so the first five are in the back, what we'd call the back, the Torah. He says the Tanakh also includes the wisdom books. That would be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And then it includes the prophets. That's everyone from Joshua to Malachi. Christians who are followers of Jesus have the right to also claim not only the Old Testament scriptures, but also the New Testament scriptures written in Greek as being scripture. Because Jesus um, commissioned the New Testament to be written. Uh, writers of the New Testament claim that what they're writing is on par with what the prophets wrote in the Old Testament. It's Scripture. Peter writes, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul, so he's writing about another apostle, Paul, also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Paul deals with difficult topics. He has a very keen intellect which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. He says what Paul writes is God-inspired scripture, just like the Old Testament. When Jesus says the scriptures testify about him, he's saying that all scripture points to him. There are four dozen prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. When Peter says, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Messiah, he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He's saying, yes, you are the fulfillment of all these Old Testament prophecies. You're the Messiah. But Jesus is not saying he's just the fulfiller of Messianic prophecies. He's saying, I'm the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament scriptures. They all point to me. When Paul had the vision on the road to Damascus, we read that then he went to Arabia for a couple of years to study the scriptures. What's he doing? He already knew this. He would have known the Torah by heart as a Pharisee. He's studying them to see how they all speak about Christ and that Christ is the fulfillment of what they're all pointing to. This means when we study the Bible, if you study the Bible tomorrow... I hope we'll all try to spend a little time every day. You're not just looking for information. You're looking for Jesus. It's a great way to pray before you start. Help me to see you, Jesus, and what you, who you are and what you want me to do as I read. Because the gospel, say this with me, is a person. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus is the life. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. He claims to be the source of life, everlasting life and life right now. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. When Jesus says he's the life, he means nothing more is needed other than me, belief in me. Following me leads to life. Solomon writes, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Jesus is the life. Jesus is not part of the gospel story. He is the gospel. He is the good news. He is the life. John says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. 
Jesus simultaneously is the most exclusive and inclusive path to life. He's exclusive in, he, in that he says he is the way. There is no other way to God the Father. He is the way to life. But he's inclusive in that he died on the cross for all people, for all people's sins around the world. So all people can come to him if they put their faith in him. Imagine children that are invited to come to a toy store and they can all pick out whatever toy they want. So kids are attracted to, you know, certain one or two. And, uh, but one little boy wraps his arm around the owner of the store, the toy keeper. He says, I want you. And in doing that, he gets every toy in the store. And that's what the gospel is. It's an invitation to wrap our arms around Jesus. The Apostle Paul sums up the truth that the gospel is Jesus in the first chapter of Colossians. The mystery, what's the mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations? What's the mystery as we go all the way through the Old Testament? But is now disclosed to the Lord's people. The mystery is that the good news is for all people. It's for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Remember, God chose the Jews as to be the people through whom he would not just reach them, but to reach all people in the world. And Paul says, now that mystery has been made known. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the gospel? It's Jesus. It's Christ in you. That's the gospel. He is the one we proclaim, Jesus, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Paul is emphasizing that Jesus is the gospel. He's the center piece. Say this with me. The gospel is a person, and his name is Jesus. That's the most incredible information on this planet. Lord Jesus, thank you that we see today that you are the gospel. Meeting you, finding you, coming into relationship with you is the gospel. It's not just points we learn from the Bible, this and that about you or God. It's you. It's knowing you. I want to give you an opportunity to pray that right now to God. Maybe you've given your life to Christ. You want to reaffirm that Jesus is the center of your faith, a relationship with him. It's not points about him. Tell him that you understand that he is the centerpiece of your faith and recommit yourself to Him. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can do it right now. Say, Jesus, I believe you're the gospel and I want you in my life. Forgive my sins. Come in. Everybody pray right now. Father, thank you for sending your Son into the world so that we can know who you are. And Jesus is the good news. Coming into a relationship with Him is how we know You. Thank You for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to invite the ushers to come at this time. We're going to receive our morning offering. I want you to take your program, Jesus Curriculum. <clears throat> Uh, if you don't have one, uh, ushers will give you one. And uh, inside is a communication card. We'd like everyone here to fill this out and uh, drop this in the offering that we're going to receive right now. We'd like to know that you're here and like you to check any next steps you'd like to take. Put a prayer request on there. And if you're a guest here for the first time, uh, if you're willing to drop this in the offering as our gift to you, we want to give you a copy of the Prayer Dare. One of our hosts will give that to you as you, as you go out. Father, thank you for this moment when we can do something <clears throat> to show you that we love you, giving of our monies. It's hard for us to do, Lord, because we have other obligations and we wonder if we'll have enough. 
But we thank you for your promise that you promise that if we give generously to you, you will take care of us. You will give back to us, but it requires faith on our part. And so help us to trust and give generously today. And use our gifts, Lord, to help us reach Portland. 50% of people in Portland have no religious background. Many of them know nothing about Jesus. Never been to church, never read a Bible. So help us to take Jesus to the people in our lives this week. And Father, we pray for our youth, our teenagers, and our younger children, that they might come to put their faith in you and grow strong in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.